This week on the Back Table Podcast. The understanding that sleep apnea is a very complex disease ultimately will help us have a better outcome with this patients if we get other physicians and colleagues involved in their treatment to offer a more comprehensive approach to treat their problem. That's the most important thing, you know, that we need to understand. And I feel very confident, you know, that if, if we include other people that also understand this condition, the treatment outcome of these patients are going to be better. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable ENT podcast, where we discuss all things ENT. We bring you the best and brightest in our field with the hope that you can take something from our show to your practice. We now have CME available. You can get AMA Category 1 CME for listening to Backtable and then filling out a reflection. You can find the CME links on the episode pages at backtable.com, or you can also find the CME links in the show notes. It's a small cost for the credit, much less than you would spend at a conference, and it helps support the show. Powered by CMEFI, using AI technology to bring the right education to the right place at the right time. You can do this in just a few minutes. If you're already listening to Backtable, might as well get a CME credit for it. Again, this helps support the show and allows us to keep bringing you great content. Now on with the episode. My name is Gopi Shaw, and I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist at UT Southwestern here in Dallas, Texas. And I have a very special guest today. I have Dr. Carlos Torre. He is an otolaryngologist specialized in the medical and surgical management of sleep disorders in Miami at his practice, Sleep, Snoring, and Sinus Clinic of Florida. He is triple boarded in otolaryngology, sleep medicine, and obesity medicine. He is here today to talk to us about building a comprehensive adult sleep practice. Welcome to the show, Dr. Torre. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gopi. It's a pleasure to be here. Carlos, first, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from. Tell us your story, your training. Okay. So uh, I grew up in Puerto Rico, in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And then uh, after high school, I went to Boston College. Uh, where I did my undergrad. And then after that, I, I decided to go back to Puerto Rico to complete medical school. While I was there between my third and my fourth year, I took a year off to participate in, uh, in a research fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco. And then from there, I went back and finished my, my med school and then went on to complete my ENT training at the University of Puerto Rico. After that, then I, I went to Stanford for two years and completed a two-year fellowship in sleep surgery and sleep medicine. And once I finished, I went to University of Miami, where I work as an assistant professor for the last four and a half years. And recently, I opened up my, my new practice um, in August of 2021, where I'm providing care as an independent provider. That's awesome. Tell us a little bit about your uh, fellowship at Stanford, because you were able to do a sleep medicine board. Um, so mm -hmm. what is that fellowship like? Is it do you spend time with the pulmonologist as well as ENT? How did, what, was, what was your fellowship like? So the first year, was, it was only sleep surgery. And that is done uh, through the Department of Otolaryngology. The program director is Dr. Robson Capasso and Dr. Stanley Liu, um, which are very well-known figures in, within the field of sleep surgery. And that was a one-year fellowship where I only did sleep surgery. Now, uh, in, I want to be board certified. And after 2011, the only way that you could become board certified in sleep medicine is if you completed a one year fellowship training in sleep medicine. So uh, I applied and it, it was a different program that I applied to. And then uh, I got accepted to the sleep medicine program at, at, at Stanford as well. And that's where I did my second year of training. Sleep medicine is a field that you can you can train in sleep medicine coming from different specialties, neurology, pediatrics, internal medicine, pulmonology, ENT. So many of the, of the, of the faculty that was training me there and also my fellow trainees, they came from different backgrounds. So I was the only ENT. I don't think within ENT, there's a lot of interest of spending a year not operating and doing only clinical yeah. work. But since I already had done a year in sleep surgery, I had a practice, I had a clinic at the VA that they, and they allowed me to continue seeing patients there once a week and doing surgery since that was very important for me. So I was able to work that out, but the majority of the time, 90% of the time I was doing just clinical work in sleep medicine and, uh, where basically you train in all kinds of sleep disorder, not only sleep apnea, but also all the parasomnias, insomnias, uh, hypersomnolence disorders, and, uh, and you learn to manage those. 
Wow. And so you're mm-hmm. also reading, learning to read sleep studies as well in yes, that time? Yes, that, okay. that's an important part of the training is to read studies and, and, and so that you can uh, practice the full scope of uh, sleep medicine as well. Okay. And then how did you find yourself boarded in obesity medicine? Because that requires, I would imagine, some internal medicine, endocrine background. H- how, did that, how did that land on, in your lap? So not necessarily. Uh, a lot of my patients obviously have a weight problem. And that's been one of the main challenges that I've had in my practice is, you know, knowing where to refer these patients and, and having some degree of control of how they are approaching that process of losing some weight, which so for so many of my patients is so important as part of their treatment. So I, I felt myself stuck, you know, with only the option of sending them to a bariatric surgeon, which many of the patients don't want to go that route or sending them to a nutritionist where you really lose complete control of the patient and you have no idea what they're doing, what kind of plan they're entering, you know, what kind of approach they're using to their weight loss. And so I decided that I wanted to be a little bit more involved in that process. And then I found out that you can actually become board certified in obesity medicine, regardless of your specialty. There's a board, the American Academy of Obesity Medicine over, over, offers a board in, in obesity medicine that you don't have to complete a training in obesity medicine, but you do have to complete certain number of credits in order to be able to sit down for the board and then take the exam. And I think it's a great tool, you know, for physicians that are managing patients with sleep disorders for that same reason, right? Because it gives you an additional understanding of how to deal with that problem, which in many of the patients is really the main problem. Right. I, I think that's such a important, like you said, it's such an important part of it. And mm-hmm. in pediatric uh, OSA, you know, we always think oh, focusing on the tonsils and anoids. But as you mm-hmm. know, obesity is such a, you know, epidemic, if you will, in, in children as well. And I find that even having that conversation um, about, OK, this is what the sleep study showed. And yes, the patient is eight. And, you know, our first step usually is taking out tonsils and adenoids. But there's a weight issue. And even having that conversation, I'll be honest, I don't, I can't think of maybe not even a handful of times in my training or in my practice of really knowing how to talk to patients and their families about the weight aspect of it. Um, so I can only imagine how important that part is in your practice. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, in my practice, the reality is that for many of my patients that have a breathing disorder like sleep apnea, Obviously, we offer CPAP as a first limb treatment, but really my goal in my practice is to target the root cause of their problem. And that could be a combination of things. Sleep apnea is a very complex disease that involves anatomical, notological, respiratory, com- respiratory components that lead to the airway collapse. So being able to identify what is causing that issue in those patients and being able to target it. It's very important if we ever want those patients to get off a CPAP or want to give them a chance of getting off a CPAP machine. Yeah. In pediatric patients, it's a little bit easier, I would say, because those patients still, uh, the complexity of the condition still not uh, as bad as it, as it is in adult patients. Uh, it's more of an anatomical issue. So that's why, you know, removing the adenoids, the tonsils, Usually yeah. leads to a good outcome, but definitely we are seeing a lot of pediatric patients that are obese that even with huge tonsils and adenoids, after you take them, they continue having symptoms. Yep. So, so I think as physician, it is very important that we understand the nutritional component and learn a little bit more about it so that we can help our patients a little bit better. Yeah. In your sleep fellowship, the one year that was not the sleep medicine, but the sleep surgery um, mm-hmm. at Stanford, what kind of um, sleep surgeries uh, were you learning? Or were you also learning like mid-face stuff? Yeah. So I was very lucky to train under Dr. Stanley Liu, who's uh, one of the pillars in skeletal surgery uh, for the management of, of sleep apnea. He was actually the fellow before me. And then he joined Dr. Capasso to uh, run this, this, this fellowship at Stanford. The good thing about this fellowship is that since it's only focused on sleep surgery, you learn all the different techniques to operate on these patients based on their particular disorder, their particular problem, and evaluating each patient independently. So we did all combination of different surgeries, 
single level, multi level, pallet, nasal, skeletal, hypoglossal nerve stimulator. So I was I was very fortunate to be part of that fellowship and to learn all these techniques that now, you know, I can offer my patients. Yeah. And then you said you did some academic medicine for a couple mm-hmm. of years. Mm-hmm. Tell me about your uh, experience in academic medicine and then what ultimately made you want to build your own practice um, and especially such a comprehensive one. So, you know, that coming out of fellowship, you have a lot of ideas and things that you want to do. I think for me and my background growing up in Puerto Rico, the practice of medicine is a little bit different there than it's, it is here in the U.S. And really academic medicine is not something that most of us consider there. You know, you go into an open up your practice and and you stayed in the private world. And, and if you want to get involved in the academic setting, then you participate, you know, one or two days a week in ENT training, you know, and, and, and residency there at the University of Puerto Rico. So my focus really was always to open my own practice. And I think I do have a little bit of that entrepreneurial mentality, you know, that I wanted to be able, be able to build that. But coming out of fellowship, I was very excited about many of the research ideas that I had and things that I wanted to do. I also felt that I still had or I still do feel that I have room for, for improvement, but I felt that the academic medicine gave me the platform, you know, to continue building on my skills, developing confidence on the things that I was doing, learning more about what things worked for me and what didn't work for me before I moved on to create my own practice. So I interview at several pra- places, actually UT Southwestern with Dr. Marple and Dr. Chan and Dr. Ron yeah. Mitchell, they, they were, uh, they, I, I interviewed there and I really, really <laughs> liked that program. And I also interviewed uh, the University of Miami. And, uh, you know, it was a very difficult decision because we, me and my wife were thinking about going back to Puerto Rico after my fellowship training, but, but we decided, you know, that it was probably a good idea to give academic medicine a try. And since Miami is so close to home, that's how I ended up at the University of Miami. And it was great. You know, I had a really great experience working there for the past four and a half years. Uh, great colleagues and, and residents that I was able to meet and, and train there as well. And it was a great opportunity for me to continue growing and learning and developing within my field. But ultimately, you know, I always had the, the dream of having my own practice. And when COVID hit that I was doing, I had nothing to do. That's when I started working on the process of, you know, getting things ready for, for my own practice and, and putting everything together in order to be able to do this. And now since August, I stopped working at the University of Miami in May. And now since August, I've been working in, in, as, as an independent provider. Wow. Congratulations. That's a, that's an amazing, uh, an awesome journey. And it, I'm really excited. Your clinic, what's, what's interesting is that it's just so comprehensive. Tell me a little bit about your staff. Is it just you and your MA? Do you have ancillary staff? Because, right, we're thinking about ENT, the weight portion. Tell me what services you offer. Okay, so so right now, I mean, you have to understand that this is a new clinic. Yeah. So right now, <laughs> it's just me and my niece. Yeah. Okay. My niece is, she's my, uh, she's my, my secretary. She's my, my billing person. She does everything for me. Yeah. Uh, well, we do it together and we're learning a lot together. And, uh, what I did initially when I left academics was that I started renting office space from another physician. He's a pulmonologist that has been, uh, part of the faculty in the hospital where I operate for many, many years. And his office is actually right in front of the hospital. So I, I've been renting office space for him, from him and, and the staff basically that I have is my knees in the front end. And I have uh, an MA that helps me during clinic and, and then, you know, services that I contract for billing and all that. But that's just what I have in the office right now. Now that I'm moving into the new facility, then the staff is definitely going to grow slowly for sure, okay. you know, but my plan always the first year, it was to offer the things that I could do on my own, that I did not need any other provider. And hopefully, you know, as the practice continues to grow, then Definitely, I'll start bringing in other people, you know, to take care of the of the obesity component. For example, I do plan to have some allergy, do allergy in my clinic as well. So also doing that. But as of now, you know, I'm, I'm basically yeah. doing everything, you know, and um, and I think that's part of starting a new practice. Right? It's definitely you have to be willing, uh, especially if you're independent, to do everything at the beginning because it takes a while 
to start building the practice and have enough patience, you know, for you to start hiring other staff and, uh, and being able to cover the costs of bringing other people into the, into your practice. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, at this point I'm basically doing everything, but moving yeah. forward, if this helps, you know, moving forward, my plan is definitely to have someone to deal with the nutrition component. Yeah. A lot of the nutrition that I do is medically based, you know, so I need to be involved in that part as well in yeah. the selection of the medications that we're going to use to help the patients lose weight and all that. But definitely the other aspect of the diet plan, exercise and everything else, you know, somebody else can take care of it. And uh, I do plan to bring other services as well that hopefully in the next few months, we're going to start with that. That include my functional therapy as well, respiratory treatment and respiratory nasal breathing retraining, which I think is a very important component in managing any kind of sleep disorder allergy clinic, uh, which I will have a nurse. I have a nurse that's going to be taking care of that part supervised by me, obviously. So yeah, I mean, it, that's, that's basically the main staff that I'm going to have initially. That sounds awesome. Okay. Now just kind of getting into how you evaluate your patients. What's your initial history and physical look like, you know, when the, you know, the adult patient comes in and they say that, listen, my partner says that I've been snoring for uh, a couple of years. What are what are some of the important things that you're always asking or looking for? Yeah, so for me, a couple of things are very important. First of all, is to have an idea of the severity of their symptoms and what other comorbidities this, this patient might might have that make their sleep apnea a more important element as part of their treatment. Right? Many of the patients that have sleep apnea, they don't necessarily have any other comorbidities. And maybe their main problem is just that they're snoring or, or they have poor sleep quality. And then the approach might be a little bit different with those patients, right? But you always want to know the severity of their conditions and what exactly you are dealing with. For me, as part of the evaluation, uh, obviously any patient where I suspect that they have sleep apnea, the first step is to conduct a sleep study to confirm that they have this condition. But as part of their management, regardless of whether it's mild, moderate, severe, sleep apnea or snoring what they have, I always try to focus initially on optimizing nasal breathing. And uh, I feel it's such an important component because if the patient does not have good, good nasal breathing, if we end up treating that patient with CPAP, they're going to have difficulty tolerating the CPAP. Even if the patient is snoring or we're trying to use other approaches to treat their sleep disorder, if they're not breathing through their nose and they're breathing through their mouth, chances are that whatever we do is not going to be as successful, have, have, have a good outcome as uh, if they were breathing optimally through their nose. So that's why I focus so much on that part as in, in the initial evaluation and, uh, and try to offer solutions, you know, for any problems that they have. And finally, you know, I also try to identify any obvious anatomical issues that might be contributing to the snoring, such as big tonsils, lingual tonsils. Anything that doesn't involve a, a more complex mechanism of airway collapse, something that is there static and creating an obstruction that we can, as ENTs, we can take care of, you know, and up already create space for the patient to breathe. Can you tell me a little bit, you had mentioned nasal breathing retraining and mm -hmm. optimizing nasal breathing. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah. So I do feel that when you look at the different phenotypes of patients with sleep apnea, nasal breathing or lack of nasal breathing always plays a role in that. And that whether that is patient to have a low arousal threshold that wake up frequently or patients that have what we call a high loop gain where they are very sensitive to any disturbance in their breathing. So all those, all these patients, you know, many of them uh, actually have very poor nasal breathing. As you know, as ENTs, we operate on patients, we can do a perfect septoplasty, turbine reduction, rhinoplasty, sinus surgery, you know, and, and, and when you look at the patient, everything looks great, but they're still breathing through their mouth. And this yeah. is patients that have been chronic mouth breathers and have never learned to breathe through their nose. So what we're trying to do, uh, we're developing a program where we are training patients, basically helping them, you know, become more conscious about breathing through their nose and giving them the different tools, you know, to be able to do that nor not only during the day, but also at night, you know, with the hope that what the training that they're doing during the day translates into more nasal breathing at night. And uh, that's really one of the goals 
of treatment. With, with pediatric patients, it's much easier to do uh, because they're, they are at a very early stage, you know, in their lives where, where these kind of changes can be made. Certainly with adults, it's a little bit more challenging, but it's something that definitely can be done. And, uh, and I consider nasal breathing as one of the pillars, you know, in the treatment of a yeah. patient with sleep disorders. And just to kind of get into more like uh, specifics or details, is that starting them on like nasal saline, Flonase, and then what are some of the, you know, exercises or how, how do you, what are the actual concrete things that patients have to do? So that's, that's where the myofunctional component comes in. And um, I know there's a lot of debate about myofunctional therapy uh, for those that are familiar with this kind of intervention. And uh, because I think that a lot of the focus has been on whether these exercises help cure sleep apnea or not. I don't, I don't think that's really the main focus that we should be given this kind of exercises. I think there are a complementary service that we can offer our patients to help them get better outcomes from whatever interventions we're doing, such as nasal surgery. So, I mean, the, the, the nasal optimization component obviously starts with taking care of any allergies or any anatomical issues that they might be having that are contributing to the nasal obstruction. But once we accomplish that, then we use the myofunctional therapy exercises, which involve, you know, it, it's very detailed in terms of, you know, having the right position of the tongue in the palate, strengthening of the facial muscles that can help the patient keep the mouth closed and uh, uh, decreasing the compensation from other muscles in the airway that might be preventing the patient from using his airway muscles optimally to be able to breathe through the nose. And the exercises that we do are basically directed at that. One of the things that we have learned is that in order to maintain adequate tone of the airway, it is very important to complement the function of the muscles, not only of the tongue, but also of the palate, right? And that is accomplished through what we call palatal coupling, which is basically, you know, being able to translate the effort that we're making with the tongue into other parts of the airway and other muscles in the airway, the airway dilator muscles. The tongue obviously is the biggest muscle that we have in the airway, okay? But it does affect many other parts through the palatoglossus muscle and palatopharyngeal muscles. So a lot of the exercises that we try to do are focused on optimizing, you know, that area of the airway so that we can keep or, or patients can maintain a good muscle tone and an open airway yeah. throughout their sleep as well. And the myofunctional therapy, is that usually through uh, speech pathology or physical therapy? No. So actually right now, most of the people or, or therapists that do myofunctional therapy are dental hygienists. Many of oh. them or, you know, some kind of technician within the dental in a dent that you will find in a dental office. There has been a little bit of resistance from my experience from speech therapists to get involved in, in the myofunctional therapy because there really is not a whole lot of data backing it up. You know, like I said, for the treatment of, of sleep apnea and for the cure of sleep apnea, but we're starting to get some really good data from, from the group of, for example, Dr. Saroosh Saggy, he's uh, in, in LA and we're starting to understand more and more, what are the benefits, you know, myofunctional therapy in the treatment of these disorders. So I hope, you know, that more people within the field start getting more involved with this and accepting it more and use it, like I said, not, not as a cure for sleep apnea, right. but as a complement of what they're doing to treat these patients. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it's minimally invasive. And if it has even a little bit of benefit, like an impact, those little those things can make a ultimately a big difference, whether it's CPAP compliance or, yeah. you know, dry mouth, even, you know, in the morning, sore throat, things like that. Absolutely. Yeah. You got nothing to lose. You got yeah. nothing. It's a non-invasive alternative that you're giving the patient. It's another tool that we have to offer these patients. And the yeah. more tools we have, the better. Right. For sure. So let's say you get, um, say, let's say you do get a sleep study in the patient. Um, are these mostly, uh, do you, do you usually send them for a home sleep study or do you prefer sleep studies in labs or do you have a preference? No. So in, in my practice, most of my patients get a home <laughs> sleep study initially. And uh, unless the patient comes in with other issues such as congestive heart failure or any other cardiac issue, COPD, neuromuscular disorder, central sleep apnea, you know, those patients get an in-lab study. Or even if patient that has a negative home sleep study where I still suspect that the patient 
might have sleep apnea and that went undetected in the home sleep study, I do offer an in-lab polysomnogram for those patients. For, but for everything else and every other patient, I usually start with a home sleep study. It's a lot more convenient for patients. We have good, very good technology these days, you know, to be, be able to make a good assessment, not only of the respiratory component, but also of the sleep stages, getting an idea of what their sleep architecture is, you know, how much time they spend in, in deep sleep, in light sleep, in REM sleep, you know, so we, we can make a very accurate assessment of what's going on with those patients by doing a home sleep study with the technology that we have available these days. Yeah. And then, um, are you reading these sleep studies, Carlos, the home sleep studies? I do. Okay. And so what's your work week flow like? Do you save like um, a full day or a couple of half days a week just to read sleep studies then in your practice? Or how do you, how do you do it all? The sleep studies, it's integrated whenever I have some space during the day. I sit down and I do the interpretation of the sleep studies and, and, and do that part. Usually the way that I have my week divided is that on, on Wednesdays when I do surgeries mm-hmm. and the rest of the days I'm in clinic. If I have procedures to be done in the office, I usually try to put all of them together on a Friday. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've been doing so far. So Friday, Wednesday is my day to go to the OR and do the bigger cases. And on Fridays I do office procedures and you know, I do see patients in between, you know, as I'm preparing someone for a balloon sinoplasty, for example, or any other in office procedure, I do see patients in between and I do. Same thing with the sleep studies. You know, I, I might do the interpretation of sleep, sleep study as I'm waiting for a patient to get prepared. And that's, that's basically how I, I try to be as efficient as possible and not, you know, not block an entire day, you know, just to read sleep studies. I feel that yeah. I'm more productive if I kind of combine everything and, and yeah. try to make use of my time as best as possible to do all the things that I need to do. That makes sense. I mean, because you're right with turnover or there's a lot of hurry up and wait in surgery. So yes, or procedures. And so you're right. There's little blocks that can always you can find to get, I guess, some of that done. Definitely. Yeah. (laughs) And then how do you talk to patients about lifestyle or wellness in the evaluation and management of these patients? You talk to them about sleep hygiene, positioning. How does that come into your treatment plan? As you know, one of the or the main sleep disorder that we see in patients in general, in the general population is not sleep apnea, it is insomnia. And insomnia in the majority of the cases from my experience is not caused by a circadian problem. It's more related to some kind of a issue, you know, related to anxiety or depression. So many of the patients that come to my clinic, yeah, they have a, a breathing disorder like sleep apnea, but Many of them also suffer from insomnia and other issues that are secondary to mental health conditions that they might be suffering and that have not been addressed. So one of the things that I like about my clinic is that I'm able to explore all the things that that are going going on with the patient, you know, and being able to make a, a good assessment and recommendation about what things we can do. Definitely, I feel that the sleep hygiene, the wellness component plays a huge role in these patients plays a very important role. And like I said, as part of the, of what we do in the nasal training exercises, a lot of it, you know, the nasal breathing is a very important component of many aspects of, or tools that we have for wellness, such as meditation, which is something that we use very commonly to treat sleep, uh, insomnia in many of these patients as well. So it, it all complements. at the end of the day, if we look at it, you know, we are focusing on the nasal breathing at the beginning. We are trying to train these patients to be able to breathe through their nose. But as part of this training, we are also giving them tools, you know, that can help them relieve their insomnia a little bit, hit, maybe meditate a little bit to help them, you know, with some of the anxiety that might be preventing them from getting a full night's sleep. And then obviously all the other sleep hygiene tools, such as keeping the right temperature of the room, keeping the dark room, being comfortable in their clothes and the sheets that they're using. You know, all those things definitely are important and, and, you know, not being exposed to light later at night, trying to eat earlier and uh, have a, a, an early dinner, uh, so that they're not going through that process of digestion, you know, while they're sleeping, which affects their body temperature and can affect their sleep. So all those tools definitely are very, very important part of the comprehensive management of these patients. Yeah. 
And then I guess maybe the um, if there is an obesity problem or a weight problem, do you also then kind of at that time go into that side of it as well with your patients? Yes, absolutely. In fact, one of the tools that we use in my practice for the treatment of obesity is fasting. And I focus a lot on the circadian component of digestion. So we know that optimally a patient should eat within an eight hour window. It could be extended up to 12 hours. Okay. But one of the things that we want to prevent is the pa is patients from ha having a late dinner. And like I mentioned before, the reason for that is that when patients eat late, which their metabolism already slowed down, which, you know, their chances of gaining weight are, are higher if they're eating late at night. But second of all, it's going to have an impact on their sleep as well, because when they're digesting that food, their poor body temperature increases. And in order to be able to sleep well, our temperature actually goes down. So that is another factor that might be compromising the capacity to have a good sleep quality. So yeah, definitely. It all, it's again, it's all connected. The wellness, the insomnia, the sleep, the weight, yeah. that's, you know, from my experience, that's what I, I, I saw, you know, and, and the reason why I decided to open something, a clinic that offers this comprehensive care, because from my experience, it's all connected. Yeah, for sure. Like you said, it's overall wellness and health that affects sleep disorders in adults and so many different yes whether it's OSA, insomnia, or both, um, mm -hmm. just to name a few of the all the sleep disorders. Yes. So, okay, so you uh, got the sleep study, you've read it, and let's say the patient has OSA, let's say mild to moderate OSA. And let's say on your exam, there isn't like, you know, huge tonsils or big lingual tonsils. Is your next step, do you do DICE? Do you do CineMRIs? And then... Uh, when do you consider like a dental or eval for oral appliance? So if the patient is diagnosed with sleep apnea, my first choice of treatment is always going to be pap therapy. It's going to be CPAP. Okay. And if they feel CPAP, then BiPAP. And we actually published the, the surgical guidelines recently through the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And after doing an extensive review, we decided that you know, the best approach continues to be CPAP for many of these patients, even if they have huge tonsils and that we know that they have a good chance of getting cured from removing them. And the reason for that is because CPAP is still very effective on these patients, one. Second of all, there's really no risk of using a CPAP machine. The worst thing that can happen is that the patient doesn't like it and they take it off. So the risk of this treatment is very low. And and, and third, you know, it's, it's a very effective treatment. That's we discussed earlier. Sleep apnea is a very complex problem that involves anatomical, neurological, respiratory. And the good thing about PAP therapy is that regardless of what is the cause of that sleep apnea or combination of causes, it's able to push in air, you know, that's going to keep the airway open. So yeah. if the patient's able to tolerate it, they might not need anything else. Now, the other options of a dental appliance or surgery are things that we consider once a patient definitely has failed treatment with CPAP. And the okay. reason for that is because even if you see a patient with big tonsils, which are the ones that have the best chance of getting cured with surgery, there might be other mechanisms leading to their condition that might still cause them to have symptoms of sleep apnea and maybe end up using a CPAP machine. But definitely, you know, once they fail treatment with CPAP, we move on to consider all the other options. And like I mentioned in the beginning, you know, Understanding the severity of the condition of the patient, what other comorbidities they have, it is very important, particularly at this stage, because knowing what consequences patients might be having from having untreated sleep apnea is going to guide our, our decision of how aggressive we want to be with the treatment. If the patient has a mild sleep apnea, you know, and, and the main issue is snoring, we might not be as aggressive with the treatment recommendations that we make, and we might consider other things, you know, like, like in-office procedures for the snoring or a dental device. But if it's, if it's a patient that even if the, he's not symptomatic, but suffers from many other comorbidities that could be associated with sleep apnea, we're definitely going to be more aggressive in terms of the surgical options that we might offer this patient, which might include a combination of multi-level surgery or doing a nerve stimulator or doing a mid-phase advancement through an MMA, depending on their presentation. Okay. 
And are you adjusting? Are you prescribing the PAP, Carlos, um, yes. and adjusting it? Okay. How does that work? So again, the the clinical part of managing sleep apnea is something that we can, many of us can feel comfortable doing pretty easily. Okay. Yeah. The technology today, these days, allows you to offer the patient, you know, CPAP treatment using an auto CPAP machine that basically monitors the patient breathing whenever they're having their apneas and is able to adjust the pressure, you know, depending on whether they're having an obstruction or not. So I, I rarely, rarely uh, send a patient f uh, to do a, a titration study after they had a positive diagnosis with a sleep study before starting treatment with CPAP. I do consider a titration study to adjust the pressure in their, in their CPAP machine. If the patient, if I see that he desaturated significantly during the sleep study, because I want to make sure that with the treatment, we correct that problem. But otherwise I started the patients on auto CPAP and then I follow up with them typically about six weeks after they start treatment with their CPAP machine. And then in the CPAP machine allows you to download their information see how they're doing, how many apnea events they're having, how compliant they are with their therapy, what is the average pressure that they are using. Remember that initially in the auto CPAP machine, you set it up at a range of pressure between a minimum of four and a maximum of 20 centimeters of water pressure. So you kind of, uh, once you get that initial information after a month of using the machine, you can start adjusting the settings in a way that it fits the, patient, the patient's needs. So, uh, and then after that, if the patient is compliant and they're being using their machine and doing well, I see them again in three months, then again in six months and then yearly. But if it's a patient that is having difficulty tolerating their CPAP machine, that is the patient that I need to see more often to understand what is going on. Maybe start digging deeper into maybe if they have nasal obstruction or things that I can do from a surgical standpoint to optimize them for treatment with CPAP and then. You know, if at the end that patient fails treatment with CPAP, then that's when we move on to the next stage of considering oral appliances or, or surgery. And what do you define as a PAP failure? So a PAP failure is a patient that cannot tolerate CPAP, basically. How much time do you give them? I try because I understand the benefits of CPAP. So it's not like a, I see them in six weeks and if they have not used their CPAP, I'm like, okay, no worries. We'll, we'll do surgery now. No, I, I definitely try to get them to tolerate their CPAP. And I'm pretty conservative in the surgical approach from that standpoint, because I do understand the benefits of CPAP. Maybe it's for my training, but I do understand. And I've seen, you know, that patients that can tolerate their CPAP, their CPAP do very well. So I do try very hard, you know, and, and, and I, and I use surgery very frequently as a tool to optimize them for CPAP therapy, rather than trying to cure them for their sleep apnea. So that's why the focus again on nasal breathing optimization and all that, but definitely, you know, if we tried and, 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 and the patient cannot tolerate the CPAP, you know, even if we try doing surgery and all that, then we move on to the next step. That would be a, a CPAP failure. There are patients that, and, and this is a minority of the cases, but there are patients that there's the severity of their condition is so bad that even with CPAP, even with high levels of BiPAP, high pressures in BiPAP, they still continue to have a high residual AHI, apnea hypopnea index, you know, so they're not responding yeah. to treatment adequately. So those are considered PAP therapy failures as well. And I found myself, for example, doing maxillomandibular advancement in patients that had a very high AHI, even on high pressures of, of BiPAP. And then we did the surgery. We didn't necessarily cure them, but now they are able to use their CPAP right. and uh, at a low pressure and get treated and, 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 and feel great, you know? So, yeah. so those are, you, I would say patients, you know, that cannot tolerate it, the, the PAP therapy or patients that do tolerate it, but that still have a very high residual AHI. Yeah. I think that's a great point um, with, mm -hmm. especially the severe cases. Mm hmm because it's not necessarily one or the other in terms of surgery or PAP. And even in kids um, who start out with very severe OSA, we may be doing, you know, the TNA, whatever it is, um, and they still may be needing PAP after, but the goal with the goal of, hey, your settings will hopefully be less. And there's an like a benefit from the PAP. We're not still at an age I have 30 <laughs> or, you know, whatever it is yeah. uh, with just the PAP. So... Absolutely. I mean, surgery plays a very important role in optimization for CPAP. Yeah. Lowering pressures, helping patients tolerate the CPAP better. 
Yeah, it's all been shown, you know, that surgery can be very effective in helping patients get being able to tolerate their CPAP machine. Yeah. And so when you are thinking about surgery, you know, whether it's PAP failure or maybe not frank OSA, but um, maybe sleep symptoms um, in an otherwise healthy adult or, you know, whatever you feel like, okay, this person, patient might actually benefit from surgery. What are mm -hmm. your next steps? How, how do you... Are you doing dices at that point, or what do you like to do next to help you figure? From my examination in the clinic, I determined that the patient has an obvious problem that I can take care of. Then we, we go ahead and do surgery first uh, without doing dice. Particularly if there's a patient that has big tonsils, lingual tonsils, adenoids, you know, those, I try to take care of those problems first. But if it's not obvious to me what's going on with this patient, I do perform dice in the majority of the patients. Many times, the patient might have uh, a deviated nasal septum or some other nasal issue that I may address at the same time that I do the sleep endoscopy. So yeah. for those patients that from my physical exam, it's not clear what might be leading to the airway collapse. I do take them to, I do a, a drug induced sleep endoscopy and I might, in many cases, I end up doing a nasal procedure if I find that, that there's a need to do it, you know, a turbine reduction at the same time. I might even do like a, implant of lateral wall implant, you know, to stabilize patients that are having collapse, dynamic collapse of the nose. I might do septoplasty after I complete my dice or even sign a surgery. So the nasal optimization component is something that many times can be done at the same time as a drug induced sleep endoscopy. But everything else, I feel that you need to wait to understand what's going on before making an assessment of what surgical procedure you can offer this patient that doesn't have a clear anatomical problem, such as big tonsils and adenoids, et cetera. How much do you think something just in the nose, so like an isolated uh, deviated septum, plays a role in OSA? I think it's underestimated because actually, if you look at the data, it hasn't been shown that treating a deviated septum or doing nasal surgery actually cures the sleep apnea or the reduction in snoring is also marginal. It's not, it's not what you would expect, okay? But again, I think that this is underestimated. And when you look, what I mentioned before of the phenotypes of sleep apnea, again, this is a very complex condition, but not being able to breathe through your nose is something that certainly can have an impact on the different phenotypes. So the reason why I think that after nasal surgery, many patients continue having sleep apnea or snoring it's precisely because they're not breathing through their nose. They're still breathing through their mouth and they're having the same issues, you know, or that are, were contributing to their sleep apnea before, you know, they wake up very easily from any kind of stimulus. You know, we know that breathing through your mouth actually causes some constriction in your lungs that, that, um, uh, makes it, you know, that leads to hyperventilation and, and that also affects the breathing of the patient that might lead them to have a poor sleep quality. You know, so there are many different things that can happen. There's increasing resistance of the airway when the patient is breathing through their mouth. So all those things, I think, contribute and we're not looking at them. And when we just look at the data, we are saying, oh, this patient had surgery and still having sleep apnea. We're not considering if this patient is actually breathing through their nose now after they had right. nasal surgery. Right. No, that's, a, mm -hmm. that's a, I think, a very important point because, again, like you said, it's a little bit more multifactorial than that one tonsil that needs to come out. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why it's so challenging, you know, the surgical aspect of this condition. Yeah. Is there a role for CINE MRI in adults? I feel like in pediatric OSA, some of the centers uh, will use CINE MRI as well. I don't think we have it as a well-defined, I think, pediatric dice. We have clinical practice guidelines on that. But there are some places that are also using CINE MRIs in pediatric OSA. Um, is there a role for that in an adult OSA? So I, I personally don't have any experience with that. From a, I think that CINE MRIs use more for the research evaluation of a patient, it definitely gives a lot of information about what's going on, but definitely the conditions are not optimal for many of these yeah. patients, right? Because you are within inside an MRI machine, there's very loud noise. You know, sometimes you have to give a little bit of sedation to these patients so that yeah. they can sleep while they're there. So that already has an impact on the collapsibility of the airway. You know, so I, I do think it's a very good tool to understand what could be some of the factors contributing to the airway collapse in some of these patients, but I do not feel that it's practical, you know, in, yeah. in, in the management in, for, you know, for a sleep clinic to be doing 
this kind of evaluation in patients on a routine basis? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for us, we use it, but again, it's at an academic center. We had to mm -hmm. make sure we have anesthesia uh, comfortable mm -hmm. with spontaneous breathing and a child with severe OSA, right? Mm -hmm. um, as well as radiologists that are comfortable also being able to re report on um, a CINI MRI. So you're right, it, it's not something that, you know, I think you have to have the resources uh, to be able to use it uh, mm -hmm. in a wide, you know, to be able to use it widespread, which would make it hard as well as what exactly is the role, right? Yeah. I don't think we've figured that out, that piece mm -hmm. out as well. And then I know we don't have too much time left, but I wanted to ask you in terms of the hypoglossal nerve stimulator, mm -hmm. are you then with your background in sleep medicine, are you then turning the stimulator on and adjusting, uh, helping patients adjust that as well in your practice? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. So I, after the patient completes the surgery, he, he comes to the clinic. We, we activate it usually about 30 days after yeah. the surgery. And from then I just follow up with the patient. I mean, there's no rush to do a titration study to determine the level of stimulation that they need. I yeah. just wait until the patient is able to tolerate, you know, the higher settings in the stimulation that we set at uh, uh, his, their device. And once the patient gets to that point, that's when we do a sleep study. It needs to be an in-lab okay. study, which I don't do. I refer those patients to another clinic to complete that, the titration study for the simulation. But that's, that's when we start working with the patient. And there are patients, you know, where the, they need to continue, even after the titration study, we need to continue adjusting the settings to make sure that they can tolerate it well. Maybe the stimulation level that is required to keep the airway open. It's uncomfortable for the patient, so we need to play around a little bit with that. And for that, I do get a very good support from my local rep here that, you know, every time that I have a patient like that, he comes and we try different settings until we can find something that works for the patient and that they can tolerate. So it's a balance between what they're comfortable tolerating as well as what is uh, helping their OSA, trying to find that yes, that happy medium there. Yeah, it, it's the same thing as with CPAP. You know, it, it right. can be a very effective treatment, but if the patient doesn't tolerate it, they're not going to use it. So it is very important to find an in-between between between effectiveness and maybe using other tools to complement the hypoglossal nerve stimulator, such as positional therapy, to keep the airway open. And at the same time, allow the patient to feel comfortable with it so that they can, they turn it on every night, which is what we want. Yeah. And um, with CPAP, I know there's like nightly logs of usage. Are there logs of usage with the hypoglossal nerve stimulator as well? Yeah. So, so when the patient comes, that's what actually what we review. We look at the compliance number of hours per week that the patient is using it. And uh, we look at the stimulation level and that's basically the main information that we get. We, unlike CPAP, we don't have the capacity to know how many apnea events the patient is having, if they're having any. So we, at that point, basically it's more based on patient symptoms and, and bed partner uh, reports of snoring or on a, any other symptoms that they might be having. So um, yeah, the information that we get in the follow-up from the hypoglossal nerve stimulator is not as comprehensive as the one that we get from a CPAP machine. The CPAP machine, actually, these days, we, we know how many apnea events per hour they're having, hours of use of, their, uh, of the machine, the pressure, leak. So we, we and it, those respiratory events, we, we have an idea of how many of them are central, or how many of them are apneas. So we do get a lot of information in, from the CPAP machine about these patients and how they're doing. And with your um, sleep medicine background, are you also managing uh, patients with central apneas or mixed events? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't get too many of them in the practice that I have right now. I don't see as many of these patients as I used to when I was in the academic setting. But yeah, I mean, I try to, and any patient that has a sleep disorder, I try to help them, you know, in any way that I can. And if I can't, then I refer them to somebody else that have more, have, have more expertise, you know, in the management of these disorders. I don't know if I, it's hard for me to imagine anybody else with more expertise at this point. No, but there are <laughs> many. That would be good, yeah. <laughs> Carlos, what else am I missing or what other final pearls um, about building a comprehensive adult sleep practice or just from your sleep experience because you're, it's just full of knowledge and I think what's great is it really highlights the complexity of um, sleep disorders in adults. Yeah, I think since the majority of the of the audience of this podcast are otolaryngologists, I think that it is very important that we understand that for us, 
we play a very essential role in the management of these patients, but that we have to collaborate with other disciplines that also take care of these patients. We have to understand that this is a very complex disease and that at the end of the day, what we want is a good patient outcome. So even though many times we feel that with our hands, we can solve a lot of the problems that these patients have, the understanding that sleep apnea is a very complex disease ultimately will help us have a better outcome with these patients if we get other physicians and colleagues involved in their treatment to offer a more comprehensive approach to treat their problem. That's the most important thing, you know, that we need to understand. And I feel very confident, you know, that if, if we include other people that also understand this condition, the treatment outcome of these patients are going to be better. Yeah. Now that, that resonates very well because I think, uh, especially, you know, obviously my experience is just children, but pediatric pulmonology is an important part, obviously ENT, uh, we have a lot more pediatric dentists, um, that play a role, I think, with pediatric OSA. They do a lot more sleep screening in clinic to also oral appliances. And I think we're trying to figure out what, where is the role of that in pediatric OSA to nutrition, weight. And I mean, like you said, it, it, there's so much uh, in terms of multidisciplinary uh, in sleep apnea. We need to understand that this is a lifelong process. This is not something that you become an adult, you gain 20 pounds, and then all of a sudden you have st start having sleep apnea. For many of these patients, the, the problems start during their development as kids. And again, going back to the same thing, I find myself repeating myself, uh, repeating myself a, a lot about the nasal breathing, but a lot ha of it has to do with poor nasal breathing. A lot of the kids that you see that have the adenoid faces, you know, open mouth breathing, eventually they, they become very narrow at the level of their maxilla. They can become retrognatic and they this already has an impact on the, on the size of their airway and then as adults, as they continue growing and that airway continues to lengthen, you know, then there's a greater chance of airway collapse because they have less space. The, the process of sleep apnea starts in childhood. And if we don't do an intervention early on, these are patients that as adults are going to have a higher risk of having this condition. So we all play a role in managing these patients and identifying this problem early on. Carlos, are you... Where can our listeners find you if they want to get more information about you, your practice, sleep apnea? Are you on any social media? I know your practice is a, has a beautiful website as well. Yes. So um, the um, website address is www.sleepandsinus.com and spelled out A-N-D. So sleepandsinus.com. My Facebook is uh, Sleep Snoring and Sinus Clinic of Florida. You can find it there. Instagram, it's sleep and sinus. I'm not super active in social media. I need to get more, more active on this, but there's some information. And then anyone that wants to reach out to me directly, they can send me an email. Uh, my email is carlos at sleepandsinus.com. Again, the and spelled out, carlossleepandsinus.com. And uh, any questions that they might have after this podcast or anything else that they would like to discuss, I'm more than open to any, any emails that they want to send me and we can communicate through there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and taking the time. I've learned a ton and I think uh, what you're doing is so amazing um, and just learning about your trajectory is super inspiring. To our listeners, uh, anybody new, thank you for stopping by and any returning listeners. Thank you again for listening to us and coming back. You can find us on SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, Apple, and Ghana. Please follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Backtable ENT. We love feedback. Reach out to us for topics, ideas, speakers, or if you ever want to come on the show. And I think that's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team lead is Karen Yen with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.